Amen. We can have our seats in Jesus' name. My name is Harriet Wangeshi Mwaneki. Unasikia tisha benzo na nita Harriet. Uo ni mtu wamekujua for years. Iyo unakujua unabadilisha unaitua Wangeshi ya atambuyo. My name is Harriet Wangeshi Mwaneki. I'm born again by the grace of God. I got born again when I was really, really young. Uh, because I have been in church and at Cornerstone from Uko, Kitambo. I studied at Cornerstone Academy. We used to wear brown uh, uniform. I think your time kulikuwa na vumbizi, makabro iko imekuja. So I think the brown uniform helped. But now the upgrade is so fire. Such a good upgrade, I love it. I was in Cornerstone 2007. Oh my God. <laughs> hey. Why? <laughs> if I knew they'd bring the archives. Hey, why in serious? Okay. <laughs> I studied between the year 2007. You can see the smile. Wow. What a girl. 2007 to 2010. And I know we have alumni. If, you've, if you're here, including Pastor Joy, alumni 2009. If you're here and you studied at Cornerstone, You've ever been at Cornerstone? Kindly stand. I want to see you. Ushai Somaya Cornerstone, there we go. The A, 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 A. Allah. Eh, eh. Oh, wonderful. I'm going to ask if you're here and you have been a parent at Cornerstone over the years, from the 90s, you can join them. There we go. A, A, A can see my mom there. Come on, table clap for these people. Oh man, you can have your seats. That's so beautiful to watch. Um, when I was at Cornerstone, Madam Lydia was my class teacher, so I'm going to ask her to stand. Lazma class teacher, Anaskia. Makofia class teacher. Teacher Benson taught me mathematics na alini chapa, lakini mwalimu wa math, hapa ni wapi. Clap for teacher Benson. There we go. Oh man, this is so beautiful. When I was at Cornerstone, I used to lead praise and worship. And unasket Shalidia and I say my yes. So I started leading praise and worship when I was really, really young, and I was in leadership positions when I was in class eight. I also used to compete for swimming. I'm senior navy guys. I'm a swimmer. I have taught many alike, and they are swimming in international waters like the Indian Ocean. So please. Munione Kando, I'll start a club to teach people how to swim. So these are some of the gifts that were seen while I was in Cornerstone Academy. And like Tisha Benson has said, we used to have chapel days where we used to go to service, we used to have praise and worship in class. There's a lot, that idea of Christian foundation, the knowledge based on Christ is real and it is true. And we're a living testimony. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to talk about a beautiful topic we're going to be talking about stewarding revival for the next generation. Stewarding revival for the next generation. I want to say thank you so much to Bishop and Pastor Alice for allowing us the opportunity to serve. So, so grateful. I also want to honor the pastors in the house, Pastor Beatrice, Pastor Brian, Pastor Richard. May the Lord bless you. We're going to be taking our theme verse from Acts chapter 2, from verse 38 to 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 47. We're talking about stewarding revival for the next generation. And the Bible says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Everybody say, for the promise. Louder, for the promise is for you and for your children. Amen. I continue. And for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings 
and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had needed. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. And the church said amen. amen. We're going to talk about stewarding revival for the next generation. If you're like me, there are some Christian words that for a long time I do not, or rather I did not like. Uh, I feel like there were Christian buzzer words that are thrown around without proper understanding, and then people shake at their boots. A word like that is you've heard somebody say, in this dimension. You're like, hey, that's so deep. In this dimension, I was very wary of some of these words. Another word I was very wary of is this word revival. Because many times, if you grew up, when I grew up, when, I grew up, when you hear the word revival, you, it's a pastor screaming and then people are falling. Do you relate? Are you relating? If you can relate, can, can you smile? <laughs> and revival used to give me a bad taste in the mouth. And because for a long time, I did not understand what revival is about. So I want us to really understand what is revival about? Why do we need revival? And how can we steward revival so that these wonderful people that were singing here, when it is their time to take over the pulpits, they'll continue to steward revival. Amen? We're going to look at four things. My goal is to cover four things. The first thing I'm going to be covering is what is revival, giving us a right understanding of what revival is. Number two, we're going to look at three examples of revival um, from different eras. Number three, we're going to talk about the effects of revival. Then we're going to talk about how to now steward that revival. Now, revival from the common dictionary, it is to keep, to revive is to keep alive, to revive, to restore that which was dead and to bring back to life. But according to the concise dictionary of the Christian tradition, revival is a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit on a church or churches in a particular area, and the results of revival are felt both in the internal life of a person and in their mission to the world. And so if revival is to bring to life that which is dead, it means that thing must have been dead first. And so the need for revival started at Genesis 3, when we have the fall of man. When you read Genesis 3, the Bible talks about how the woman was deceived. Amen? And the Bible says a very interesting thing. If there's a man seated next to you, Tabu, tap him like this. Tap him. The Bible says, <laughs> when the woman was deceived, Eve took the fruit and gave to her husband, who was right there. Yani akidanganyo ita imyote, Adam alikuwa mesmama hapo tu amenyama. And that's why we need men to arise and say something. Sindio? Right? And so the fall of man brings us to a place where we need revival because something has died. There is separation from the person and the relationship with God. There is a cutoff. There is a disconnection. And so because of that death, there was need for revival. Revival talks about how we have a need to wake up, to rise up and follow and go back to that relationship with God. Where there is sin and rebellion against God, there is a need for revival. And so one of the things that the Lord has been teaching me of late is that revival is not a bad word. It does not mean uh, being a fanatic and falling over. It actually means having a relationship, a personal relationship and a personal devotion unto the Lord. Amen? I want us to look at three key examples of revival. The first one is the Pentecostal revival. What we just read, Acts chapter 2 from verse 38 all the way to verse 41, the background story starts from Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And this is what the Bible says. I'm just going to read a bit. 
When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The background story is that the Lord Jesus Christ has walked with the disciples for three years. And because this class, Yaleo, <laughs> took on a wanafunzi, it akua kama CRE lesson. By the way, I was very good at CRE, and my teacher can attest. And that is why I'm standing here, because there's that foundation. Amen? So now, how many disciples did Jesus have? Hey, you see? You see? You can all say it together. 12, very good. Out of those 12, as we find ourselves on this day of Pentecost, how many are there? This is a trick question. 11. Ay, this mkombele. Ununa wengine ata mkwa nwajo wako 11. Kwa nini wako 11? Why are they 11? Yes? Oh, wow. A good club. Very good. One of them disappointed? Jesus. Who is this person who disappointed Jesus loudly together? Judas. Judas. Some of you are so mkotu hivi. Hata ujui ni biblia gani inasemwa. Ndiyo hiyo. Knowledge founded on Christ. So by the time they are finding themselves in chapter 2 verse 1, they are no longer 12. They are 11. Because one of them disappointed? Jesus. That is so powerful. One of them disappointed? Jesus. And so as they are 11, the Lord Jesus as he left, he said that he will give them a helper. He will not leave them as orphans. And so he instructed them to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so we find ourselves in an upper room in the scene number 2 which is Acts chapter 2. We find ourselves in the upper room and these people are waiting for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And many of us know the story. The Spirit comes and there are tongues of fire and they speak in new tongues. But something beautiful happens. Those who are fearful, Peter who denied Jesus three times, full of fear and was a coward, in this Pentecostal revival stood up in boldness and the entire chapter 2 is him giving a sermon about who Jesus is and how he came on earth to save. And he calls the people who are in that place to repent. The Bible says, if you read Acts chapter 2, that there had gathered many people from all nations. And as they were hearing these people speaking tongues, they thought, why are these people drunk in wine this early morning? And Peter arises and says, no, we are not drunk in wine. This is what the Lord can do. And after that, there broke a revival within this place. And this revival was accomplished with signs and wonders. Amen. And this is the thing about revival, that when the Spirit of the Lord moves upon his people, revives his people, the change is visible. Amen. The change is visible. There was boldness and all these other beautiful things. I want us to look at two other revivals that mean something to us. We're going to do a little of history today. Again, I was very good in social studies. I looked like I was good in everything. Masabu ndio nilikuwa na chapwa, guys, because... And here I am. Here I, I am. I want us to talk about the Reformation revival. The Reformation revival. We're going to took, look at three aspects. We're going to get deep into a bit of history, but I promise it has a point. Look at your neighbor, tell them it has a point. Now, the Reformation revival happens within the 1400s. This is the 15th century. And we're going to look at two people who are very key as we talk about the Reformation revival. We're going to look at Martin Luther, the original Martin Luther. We're also going to look at a guy called John Knox. And we're going to look at why they're very important as we think about Christian traditions and where the church is coming from and the aspect of revival. Now, by the time Martin Luther is being born in 1483, what had happened is, do you know that TikTok? What had happened is, okay, I'm really late, sour. So what had happened is that by the time the apostles have continued with the work of revival, at some point the Roman Empire took up the church. And so the entire church became Roman Catholic. 
And so the church at that time had so much power. This is the 1100s, the 1200s, the 1300s. The church had so much power and had integrated with the state. And so some men within the church back in the day were not stewarding their power well. For example, they had this thing called an indulgence. And what an indulgence was, if you sinned, you gave some money to be forgiven, and then you were forgiven. Now imagine those people who could not afford an indulgence. What did that mean? Did that mean that they could not be forgiven? Something to think about, right? At this time, the Bible was kept. It was a collection of scrolls, and it was kept by the Pope and at the church and could not be accessed by anybody else. On top of that, it was in Latin. I want you to think about this time. It was in Latin. So you couldn't know whatever who ananiambia, iko ama haiko. It's not like now where the Lord has liberated us that you have a Bible or two in your home. By the way, when you're not reading your Bible, you're doing a disservice to every person who labored in the Lord to make sure this Bible is translated to every language so that we can have direct access to God. Amen? When you have a Bible in the home that's gathering dust, there are people that paid a price. They were burnt at stakes. And the price at that time from deviating from the Roman Catholic Church was excommunication and death by the Pope. When I look at the church that we have right now in the 21st century, the joy to gather together and as an African woman to stand here on this pulpit and share the word, I think of all the missionaries, the men of God who paid such a high price for this salvation that we have today. And so in the Reformation age, the reason why there needed to be a revival is because the church had started to abuse unfortunately, at that time, the privileges they had. And there was a man called Martin Luther, who was a theologist and a priest. He was a white German. And what happened is, as he was there in seminary, reading his word, reading his Bible, because he had the privilege, he started to translate it. And he started to discover that there are some things that were off that were being taught. And he came up with these five principles. If you're writing, you can write them, that I want us to look at today. And this became the foundation for the Protestant church, church which we get to enjoy up to today. And these five principles are called solas, the five solas. And sola in Latin basically means alone, this alone. And we have the first one, sola scriptura. And the basis of this principle is scripture alone. It means that scripture is the only authority over the believer. That it is the first authority over every person who has given themselves to Jesus Christ. It is not an idea of a person. It is the living word of God that has the right and place to tell a believer what to do. And if scripture says that forgiveness is a grace from God, it is free of charge, then every Christian knows that if they repent and accept the Lord Jesus, then they are forgiven. We have the second principle, sola fide. This is the principle that is based on, on faith, talking about by faith alone, that we are justified in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, that nothing, not our works, it is not our works that justify us before the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the third one, sola gratia, talking about by grace alone, that it is the grace of God that shines mercy on us. That now we have the power to say no to every form of ungodliness. That's what Titus talks about. That now the grace of God has shown on every man that we have power to say no to every form of ungodliness. We have the fourth one, Sola Christus. Talking about Christ alone. That it is the redemption of Jesus Christ at the cross that makes you and I free. It is not our indulgence. It is not our work. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice at Calvary. And then finally, we have Solidio Gloria, talking about that all these things are for the glory of God alone. It is not for the glory of man. It is not for the glory of an institution. It is for the glory of God. And what happened is, what had happened is, by standing up with these principles, immediately Luther was excommunicated. He was accused of heresy and spent his entire life running away from the Pope. 
spent his entire life running away from the Roman Catholic Church. And what happened after that is that he translated the Bible from original Greek to German. And then eventually all those um, revivals within the Reformation, many people arose after Luther to continue to translate the Bible into English and so on and so forth. Amen? Now, eventually, he started the Lutheran Church after his name, Martin Luther. And one of the people that I want us to look at next is called John Knox. Knox is written K-N-O-X. And this is a man who was also part of the Protestant Reformation in Scotland. He was talking about a form of reformation from the church as well. And these were his principles, four principles. Number one, that Holy Scripture is the only sufficient role, rule of faith and practice. That everything that we have should be guided by the Bible itself. Amen? Amen? Amen. He talks about the second principle. Faith alone justifies a person. Very similar to what we've just read on Sola Fide. Number three, talking about how a minister is a teacher and a servant and a steward, not a civil authority over people. Talking about congregation participation, what we have today. I mean, when you think about this history, a price has been paid. I want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to tell them a price has been paid. Look at the other one, tell them a price has been paid. Now, these two characters, Martin Luther and John Knox, will lead us into our third reformation. And this one is very, very, very important. Martin Luther, after forming the Lutheran church, comes the first missionary to Kenya. I'm back with my question. Who was the first missionary to Kenya? Yes? Mart no. <laughs> first missionary to Kenya, first missionary to Kenya. I'm Kufanya history, guys. I'm just the first missionary to Kenya in 1844. Mutajua leo ni kona stone Sunday. Tebu deliberate with your neighbor. Muliza ne apo na kuna ku Google. Don't Google. First missionary to Kenya, 1844. Lu? Lu? Yes, Ludwig Kraft. Hey, guys. Hey. Ni juam kupitia kona stone amani nini? Bring your children to kona stone. They'll know the first missionary to Kenya. Ah, yeah. The first missionary to Kenya, ah, yeah. let's listen, let's, let's listen. The first missionary to Kenya is Ludwig Kraft. Comes into the country 1844, and really, it wasn't even a country. In fact, when you read history books, they tell you, uh, stopped at the harbor within the East African place, um, 1844, because we weren't even a country by then. And Ludwig Kraft, as he's coming to Kenya in 1844, he's a Lutheran. Which means, if Martin Luther had not stood for something, we wouldn't have had a Lutheran church, we wouldn't have had the first missionary to Kenya, Ludwig Kraft. Which leads me to say that stewarding revival is what will hold the next generation. If our next generation has a future, we need to stand up and steward this revival and stand for the truth. Amen? And so Ludwig Kraft arrives 1844, and he's the founder of the Anglican Church of Kenya. Now, his wife, I want, you to, I want you to tell your neighbor again, there is a price that has been paid. His wife and child did not survive much. They died in Mombasa because of malaria. He continued to journey from um, the coast all the way to the highlands, talking about Jesus and founding the Anglican Church even after his wife and child died of malaria. Now, from John Knox, John Knox founded the Presbyterian Church of Scotland. Now, out of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, enter scene three, where we have a man called Thomason, Thomas Watson, who founded the Presbyterian Church of Kenya, of East Africa. And this team arrived in Kibwezi in 1891. By the grace of God, I am a missionary at heart, and so I do missions. And around two weeks ago, we were in Kibwezi with the Presbyterian Church just to retrace the journey they've walked for the last 133 years. As you can tell, Mr. Watson and his team arrived in Kibwezi in 18, 
91. And in Kibwezi, they have a cemetery for around 12 missionaries. And these missionaries, when they arrived, their ages were 17, 18, 20. They came in with their wives, their children, and many of them did not make it past Kibwezi. In fact, only Mr. Watson and one other guy are the ones who proceeded from Kibwezi to Thogoto, where we have the Church of the Torch. Many of them in Kibwezi died by malaria, were killed by wild animals, because this is 1891. They literally left Scotland. You know that song we sing that I have decided to follow Jesus? When you think about the joy that we get to experience today, it's because these missionaries literally meant that song, that I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Look at somebody else, tell them the price has been paid. And it is heavy. It is a heavy price. And so even as we think of revival in the 21st century, revival is not filling Kasarani Stadium through, during Rema Fest. Rema Fest is beautiful and it is wonderful, but revival is beyond filling Kasarani Stadium at Rema Fest. Revival is beyond Benihim coming to Kenya for three days and Nairobi is in a standstill. Revival is personal devotion, deciding that Wangeshi Mwaneki, with my family now and coming, we shall follow the Lord, we shall serve the Lord, my children will serve the Lord, my children will know the Lord. That is what we mean when we talk about revival. It is turning away from everything that holds you back, every weight. Hebrews talks about it, every weight that so easily entangles. Because the fruit of the revival, if truly Nairobi is walking into revival, the fruit of revival is the young people saying no to every form of ungodliness. It is clubs and bars shutting at Mirema and filling up Shiloh and any other church around this place. That is the kind of revival that we are talking about because a heavy price has been paid for us to enjoy the salvation that we enjoy today. So Thomas and Watson, the Presbyterian, starts the church within the PCA. And if you look at the history of the church, actually, let me ask a question. Where you come from, from your family, if your family, Uko Ushago, has a history of Anglican church, raise your hand. If your family has a history of the Presbyterian Church of East Africa, raise your hand, PCA. If your family has a history of the, go the full gospel, raise your hand. This is what I'm saying. This is exactly what I'm saying. That that foundation of the Anglican church raised you up, raised your people. Now that you're older, you're able to also take up for yourself. This is what I'm talking about. That many of us have a rich history of what these people died for. To bring Jesus into this country. Amen? Are you getting the sense? Are you getting the sense? I want us to quickly run into how to steward revival for the next generation. And then we're going to talk about the effects. We're going to look at how to steward revival for the next generation. Number one, and it's similar to what we've just read in Acts chapter 2 from verse 42. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Out of that, point number one, the one way to steward revival for the next generation is to have a personal devotion with the Lord. That is away from what we do on Sunday. Sunday is beautiful, community is beautiful, and it is actually my second point. But the sermon on Sunday is not able to sustain your Christian life. You have to love the Lord for yourself as an individual. You have to learn how to read the Bible for yourself. You have to learn how to look and seek the face of God as an individual for yourself. Because the truth is, our children are watching. I was reading a post by one of my favorite teachers of the world, word. Her name is Jackie Hill. And she was saying that one of the things she has had to redo is every time she has her personal study, she does it in her office, but she does it with a computer and the iPad. 
And so one of our children, I think, made a comment about how she's always on the laptop because they are not able, they, they just know who kwa computer. So she was saying how she has realized she needs to also be doing her devotion with a physical Bible so that her kids can see she's seeking the face of God. Why is that important? I know the parents in this place will tell you, these ones they don't hear, they see. They will replicate what it is we are doing. And so if we are seeking to have a personal relationship with the Lord, we are seeking to grow in our devotion of the Lord, we are stewarding them to know that for revival to happen in their generation, it starts from an individual level. Amen? Look at your neighbor. Mtangalia neighbors leo kabisa. Smilea neighbor. Ata jua jina yake because we shall look at our neighbors until we look at them again. Tell them it starts with a personal devotion. It starts with a personal devotion. And a personal devotion is not standing and saying you love the Lord before, in front of people. It's keeping the closet at home active and alive. That these people are seeing you seek the Lord. When things are difficult, they are seeing you kneel and tell God, come through. They are seeing miracle signs and wonders in your home. Before umpe piriton, unamuombea pia. By the way, my parents believe in healing and believe in God as a healer. Amen? Number two, how we're going to steward revival for the next generation is through fellowship and community. Fellowship and community. Fellowship and community. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 from verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Fellowship and community is not an option for a believer. If you want to grow, you have to be intentional in fellowship and community. Before revival breaks out in the stadiums, before revival breaks out in the streets, it starts at home. It starts with the cell groups. It starts with the youth networks. It starts within the small spaces that we find ourselves in before it can go and hit the streets and hit the nations and hit the stadiums. So we need to be intentional so that these people know you belong somewhere in a fellowship. You belong in a Bible study group that meets regularly. They need to also be part of that um, fellowship and community. That is where our gifts are discovered. Our love of, for the Lord is also grown. Amen? Amen? Fellowship and community is not an option. The Bible talks in Hebrews about not neglecting the coming together of believers, the coming together of the saints. For us to steward revival, we need, it is a, a serious need to be in fellowship and community. The second is breaking of bread and prayer. When they talk of breaking of bread, they talk about the Eucharist, the communion, the, the Holy Communion. I remember one time we had gone to do missions in Zambia, and the lady that was hosting us, um, when we just arrived in her house, you know the way all Africans, by the way, are the same. Every African. Ukifika tu kwa nyumba yake, chai, chakula. But this one was different because I remember when we got there, she was like, oh, we are so honored to have missionaries come to our home and so on and so forth. And the first thing she said is, we have to share in communion. And they had prepared a table and we gathered together, we sang hymns and we just shared in the Eucharist. I was wondering, we have to. And when you think about it, this is what the old apostles used to do. They used to gather together at homes, break bread together and share with the Eucharist. And when you're sharing communion with somebody, the thing is, you can't be bitter with them. You can't share communion with somebody you've not forgiven. You can't share communion with somebody you're still mad at. Right? There is a working of the Holy Spirit in you. And so communion already calls us to better living. It calls us to a higher standard. It calls us to live selflessly. Because as we share communion, we are sharing in our faith that we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. 
that we are eating the body of Jesus Christ. Which body? The body that was pierced for our salvation. Which blood? The blood that was, that was um, coming out of his body so that you and I could be redeemed. And so the place of the Eucharist and the place of communion is to bind together believers that when we come here, even as we share communion, these ones get to see, the next generation gets to see that in sharing communion, we forgive one another. Jesus is talking in the book of Matthew, setting a higher standard. And he's saying that if you are going to bring your sacrifice at the altar, yet you have not forgiven your neighbor, leave the sacrifice, go make peace, then come give the sacrifice. True or true? It's holding us to a higher standard. So in the place of breaking bread and praying together as a community, we will be edified. We will walk in true righteousness. Not fake church righteousness. Not Christianness. Ya bwana asifiwe. Apachini. Lakini umtu umemkasirikia. Miakatatu umbili moja. Unamuonango. Then unendo unasmile. Amen. Mimi ni kiwa cornerstone. Our teachers used to keep it real. Sasa I am a product of that keeping it real. Amen. And so as we break bread together and as we engage in prayers, this generation is being stewarded to know that revival will only take place in a place where people have decided, I want to do the right thing. I want to live for the Lord. I want to put every bitterness and unforgiveness aside. I want to truly emulate the life of Jesus Christ. I do not want to disappoint Jesus. I do not want to disappoint Jesus. I want to live a life of righteousness. And then finally, how we are going to steward revival for the next generation is through discipleship through discipleship. Now, discipleship goes beyond the classes that we have. The classes that we have are good. They are a good basis as you're coming to, to salvation as a new convert. But discipleship goes further. Discipleship is you taking a young lady and seeing that they love the Lord and doing life with them. It's having long conversations with this disciple. It's what Jesus did with the disciples for three years. It's what Elijah did with Elisha. It's what Paul does with Timothy and Titus. It's literally taking a person and doing life with them. Because when we stand and we sit in classes and we do those classes, it's beautiful. But that person is not able to see you face challenges beyond that classroom. Discipleship is me looking at somebody who has gone ahead of me in terms of salvation and seeing this is how they respond to anger. This is how they respond when things are not going well. This is how they respond in seasons of joy because life is also not just doom and gloom. There are seasons of joy, right? This is how they do their, this is how they take care of their family. Titus 2 addresses something that is very similar to discipleship. Titus, um, I mean, Paul is telling Titus in Titus 2 that the older women should take the younger women and train them on how to keep their homes, how to be homemakers, how to love their husbands and their children, be self-controlled. That is a form of discipleship. And it is beyond being in a classroom. If this generation is going to take up revival and move with it for days and years to come. They need to see a working form of discipleship. Pastor Brian likes to say, ni nani aneza kuambia wacha? Na uwache. Ama wewe ni idi amin kwa salvation. Hakuna mtu aneza kuambia kitu. Absolutely. You are the alpha and omega of your life. You belong in a community, but when kusema, you cannot be told stop and stop. You cannot be told this is wrong and this is right. That is what discipleship is. That you have a community that you're accountable to. They can tell you, this is going in a bad direction. And you listen with grace and you pick it up and you practice what is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Time is really running. We're going to look at the effects of revival. The effects of revival. Number one, the first effect of revival is repentance and conversion. 
The Bible says in chapter 2 of Acts, I'm going to read... Um, I'm going to read verse 46 all the way to 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And this is the key part. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. One of the immediate effects of revival, true revival, is that we have people surrendering their lives to Jesus. There is a move of conversions. When you think about the Pentecostal um, revival, what we were just talking about in Acts chapter 2, the Bible said, says, I'm looking for that part, that that day when Pen the Pentecostal revival started or broke out, 3,000 people got born again. That's a huge, I have seen it, verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's the first effect, the first fruit of revival, that people give their lives to the Lord. There is a serious conversion. When you look at the Reformation and the beginning of people literally surrendering their lives, and there was a mass exodus from the Roman Catholic Church into the Protestant Church, and you guys are the fruit of the, of the Reformation. Just like we have seen when I asked how many have a background of the Anglican Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Full Gospel Church. All of you are a fruit of that revival that started with Martin Luther and his friends. So the first fruit of revival is that people surrender their lives to the Lord. And people are sustained in their belief for the Lord. Amen? The second thing is miracles, signs, and wonder. If you read Acts chapter 3, talking about how they were stewarding this revival, the next thing that happens in Acts chapter 3 is that Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. We know this story. And it is the ninth hour of prayer. And so they are on their way, and at the gate, they meet this guy who was? Who was? Who was? Lame. And what did Peter and John say to this lame man? What did Peter and John say to this lame guy? But Mukorada. Silver and gold we do not have, but what we have. We give unto you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Miracles, signs, and wonders follow, a pl follow um, revival. It is one of the effects of revival. And it's not just miracles, signs, and wonders outside there. It's miracles, signs, and wonders. Even in your home, your family members start to see, Hey, na uyu mungu ni kama ni weukweli, wacha tupeane maisha yetu kwa mungu. That is miracles, signs, and wonders. The third thing that happens when revival has happened is that there is an outpour of boldness and courage to stand up for the truth even when it goes against the norm. Even when it goes against the norm. There is an outpour of boldness and truth. People are standing and they are saying we know the way and we are going to walk in it. People stand up for the truth even when it costs them. Because when you read the book of Acts and you look at the history of how some of these apostles died, you look at probably Peter, who said, if you're going to crucify me, you can't crucify me the way my Lord and Jesus was crucified. You need to crucify me upside down. I can't, you can't equate me to the Lord Jesus and crucify me while upright. It's people who are put in boiling oil. I mean, there's a price that has been paid for us to experience salvation as we know it today. It is people standing for the truth and they're not afraid of what culture dictates. They're not afraid of what um, the world is saying. It's young people choosing to do the right thing and honor God beyond culture, beyond the world. 
when they are saying soko ni chafu Nairobi, you stand for the truth and say soko sio chafu, mi ni kopande ya fruits. Amen? It's literally standing against the culture and the world. As people are going this way, you, you're swimming upstream because you know whom you have believed. And you are assured that he's able to keep you and sustain you. By the way, this idea of Nairobi, Nairobi, and all the nicknames, we need to start and say revival has to happen in Kenya. And if Nairobi is the gateway to this country, then we need to stand against some of these words. Loose words that talk against our beautiful cap capital city and talk against Kenya. Because the people from, from outside there who God has revealed to them that Kenya is a springboard of revival. They can't be saying Kenya is a, spring for, is a springboard of revival and as we are saying Nairobi, is the soko is dirty. Okay, kitoka na English pia, sound poor. Soko ni chafu. Amen? It's being countercultural, going against the norm and standing for the truth, even when the culture has decided that the truth is not fitting for them. And there is no this idea of my truth, your truth. That's a lie from the devil. Because my truth, your truth, is what will say that we can license gay marriages in this country. See me, I'm living my truth. See, love is love. Remember, we are stewarding for this genre? We are stewarding for this genre? And if you think it is bad now, now when those ones have taken over the pulpit, what will they be fighting? And let us not think this is a European problem. This is a the West problem. It is here with us. And we need them to stand for the truth, and the only way they will stand for the truth if, is if they see you and me standing for the truth. Saying, no, my generation will not perish. Saying, no, it will not go to the drains. There has to be a difference. Amen? The fourth effect of revival is generous living and giving. Where people give their resources, their time, their knowledge, and even their lives. You look at Martin Luther, you look at Ludwig Kraff. I mean, for the sake of the gospel, his wife and children died. Many of these missionaries, by the way, did not even make it to the coastlines because technology a ship then seaside, and there were no planes. So some of them, many of them, would die in ships on their way to this quote-unquote dark continent to bring Jesus. That is the price. No wonder we can't allow our Bibles to gather dust. We can't. You're doing this missionaries a disservice. Because you are having the privilege of what they so greatly fought for. You are having the privilege of what they died for. Finally, an effect of revival is a pure gladness and joy even as we enjoy salvation. That the people of God are full of radiance. They are joyful. They have the joy of the Lord in them because God is working out a revival in them and in their lives. I want you to stand up. And we're going to cry out to the Lord. Please, kindly stand up. We're going to cry out to the Lord that he would pour his spirit upon us and we would see revival in our generation. And this revival would be burning and would stay alive for the next generation to find it. So open your mouth. Tell the Lord to pour out revival in your own personal life. Tell the Lord to pour out revival in your own family. Ask the Lord to revive the places that are dead, dead in your own personal life. Ask the Lord to revive the closet in the at home the secret place that could be dead the bible says that the fire at the altar should keep burning it should never go out ask the lord to cause the fire to keep burning in your home the fire of personal devotion the fire of reading the word of god ask the lord to visit your family that revival would break through in your own personal life 
ask the Lord to revive the church of Kenya that we could see the high price that has been paid for us ask the Lord to revive your members ask the Lord to revive your parents ask the Lord to revive the people from your family ask the Lord that he would that he would keep this revival so that the next generation could see it Come on, you cannot afford to be quiet. You need to open up your mouth, open up your voice. Ask the Lord for a revival. A revival that goes beyond the homes. A revival that is more than just the stadiums that we know. Ask the Lord for a revival in your heart. That He would revive your heart, revive your mind to love Him and honor Him and serve Him. Would you revive us, my God? Revive us in the secret place. Revive us, my Father, so that the next generation can take up this revival. We are not the ones who will fall back. We are not the ones who will fall back, my Lord. Revive us. Revive us, oh God, one more time. Revive us in the love for you, my Father. Revive us, oh Lord Jesus. Revive us. Revive us. Ask the Lord to revive you from the depths of your being. And that he would pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. Ask the Lord for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because revival is not revival without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the engineer of revival.
yet made the decision to follow Jesus. I said I am a missionary at heart. And it would be an injustice if we shared this beautiful word. And I didn't give anybody the opportunity to give their lives to Jesus. So if you're here and you want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you're saying today on this beautiful day of 17th of March, 2024, you want to follow the Lord. If you raise your hand, these people will see you and they'll come and pray with you. You don't have to come here. If you raise your hand, somebody will come to where you are and they will lead you to Christ. Could there be anyone? Could there be anyone who is saying, I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? I want to make that decision to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I am done with the world, the cross before me, the world behind me. I want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anyone? Oh, you're here. You're born again, but you fell away. And you want to rededicate your life back to the Lord. You want to follow this God who died for you, who did not just stay in heaven and say a word for your deliverance. But he came down in the form of Jesus Christ and he paid the price. Could you be there? You want to rededicate your life to the Lord. You want to follow afresh this God. If you lift your hand, we will see you and pray with you. Anybody? Anyone? Hallelujah. Anybody? Turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided I will follow Him. our lives, you would revive our family members, you would revive our wives and our husband, our children, my God, will be revived. We pray for a revival, my Father, that starts with a personal devotion. In the name of Jesus, would you revive our community, revive this region of Mirema, revive Roisambu, my Father, that our children will no longer die in the things of the world, but they will be revived to live for righteousness. Would you revive Zimmerman? Would you revive Kasarani? Revive our location, my God. Revive our community. Revive the church of Jesus Christ, the bride of Jesus Christ. Revive us, my Father. Revive us in our hearts. Revive us, my Father, and give us the power to steward this revival for the next generation. That this revival will live beyond us. It will follow our children because you are a generational God. We call you the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are a generational God. We declare that today our generation will not fall away. And the generation that comes after us is safe in your hands in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this revival. Would you sustain it to the praise and honor of your name? Receive our praise receive our honor, receive our adoration. For this we have prayed in Jesus' name.